everybody. Thanks for joining us on this installment of our latest Tech on Tap, which is improving cycle time and tool life with adaptive control product suite from Siemens. So again, appreciate the time you took out this morning. Um, the recording has started, just as an FYI. Also, the presentation and the recording will be posted on our website shortly after the presentation. With that, I'll pass it over to Steve and Garrett. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Nick. Thank you very much. My name is Garrett Zoka. I'm a partner manager for Siemens Motion Control Product Portfolio. And through uh, value added partners um, like Electromatic, we've come here today to um, showcase one of our, um, what we would call bread and butter products, uh, which is our adaptive control product suite. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please put them in the chat and I'll field the questions um, once Steve gets done with the technical and um, storyline presentation. Um, and again, Thank you for uh, joining us today and really appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedules. Uh, with that, Steve, uh, up back to you. Uh, sure. Do you want me to do the presentation or just do a short introduction of myself? I think you can go ahead and say hello and then we can uh, jump into the presentation <laughs> after that. Perfect. Well, thanks again. Like everyone said, uh, I really appreciate you guys joining in to listen to our presentation today. Um, my name is Stephen Free. I've been with Siemens for about four years now. Um, my role is a uh, engineering solutions consultant. Um, so essentially, I assist on other engineers across the country um, on implementing and utilizing software to help make better business decisions. Um, and the product that we're showcasing today is adaptive control and monitoring. Um, I'll essentially go into details and kind of put yourself in the shoes of a typical engineer or a manager or kind of trying to solve a problem in, in a real world scenario. Um, and we're going to solve this problem using digitalization software and the specific software we're utilizing is, uh, as you can see on the main screen here, adaptive control. Um, so without further ado, I'll share my screen and we can begin the presentation. <clears throat> okay, adaptive control and monitoring. So we're going to assume the following scenario. One machine and one operator is making one part per shift. Maybe not the most realistic scenario, but you know, I've also seen worst case uh, situations. But let's, let's just assume the following for, for this case study. And with this information, if we have one machine, one operator, and one part, and we multiply by three, we can assume that therefore three machines and three operators are making three parts. You know, pretty straightforward um, linear graph of, of expansion. Now, what if we needed a fourth a fourth part? This is a very real scenario for most you know machine shops across the country, where all of a sudden maybe your bandwidth can't reach the demand. Is your solution to buy another machine, hire another operator? Add another shift over time. Now, it's entirely possible you're already working 24 hour shifts. Maybe all the machines are being utilized. Maybe throwing overtime isn't really going to change anything strictly from a bandwidth perspective. Um, and it kind of puts the pressure on your back as, as maybe like a shop floor manager where, look, we need to get another part out the door to meet our client or our customer demand. And, and how do we solve this? How, how do we solve this problem of, you know, producing? more parts with what we have already. Um, I guess if you if you to back up for a second, how do you know that one machine and one operator is equaling one part? You know, from, from the assumption, maybe, I mean, that's probably the first step you should take here is this, that from the assumption we have one machine, one operator is one part, but but how do you truly know that? Um, has it always been told to you? Is this, is this just how it's always been? And really the question comes is, is can this be calculated? Can this be calculated to better determine are we fully utilizing our, our bandwidth to produce the parts and change the status quo? Um, assuming that it can be calculated, we can therefore infer you know, the overall productivity of our machine. Are our machines being 100% productive? Maybe it's only 50% you know, productive of the time. And with that other 50%, we have the opportunity to be more productive and therefore produce more parts in our current shift. Um, is the feed override, you know, being fully utilized? Has is it just sitting idle half the time of the day? Maybe, you know, your machines are quote unquote working and they're in production status, but the feed overrides idling around 50% or lower because of um, maybe 
changes in the NC program or potential damages that could be done on the workpiece quality, and it just requires you to run slower for whatever reason. Um, or comparing even shifts. How does first shift compare to second shift compared to third shift and, and so on? Um, and obviously downtime is something you know you can always always jump in and, and want to prevent from um from an from a production perspective, you certainly don't want any type of downtime. But the point is these questions we're asking, these these thought provoking questions of like what what if what we know isn't true? And if it's not true, what is the actual data? How how are we getting this information? This these type of questions you're asking is is the basis of digitalization. It's the basis of taking data from machine controllers, taking data from anything around the shop floor, aggregating the data, analyzing the data, and then coming to these you know critical business conclusions based on all of this information. When you make a decision, would you rather have more information or less information? And it, it seems like a rhetorical question, but you'd be surprised at how often people are making choices with with such little little data to back up. It's almost based off of like an intuition. But with digitalization, you you can make this these these business critical decisions with a plethora of information, with um, you know action items and guides and graphs and and whatever it takes to you know fully fully capture. Um, and an idea and then fully understanding the, the utilization of your machines on the shop floor. So with that, assuming we're we're making these changes with digitalization, we're asking the questions based on digitalization. The next step is really how do we implement digitalization on the shop floor? Um, you know, we can monitor machines and determine essentially what the percentage of time they're they're in production versus out of production. You know, these are kind of continuing on what I already talked about today. Um, maybe we're monitoring the operators and occurring uh, I, or, or identifying reoccurring stand reasons. So, for example, something is happening to a machine on the shop floor that's taking it offline for an hour every day, which can be a simple fix, but maybe the operators are just unaware of of how it's done and it keeps requiring the maintenance guy to come over to make these changes. It's it's really just identifying through digitalization is identifying where there are gaps in the entire process or where there's areas of improvement. Um, and through digitalization, it's highlighting where these occur and then kind of feed the action items in the next step as to how this can be resolved. Now, by implementing these changes, um, again, we're we're just throwing some, some random numbers out here. What if we assume that 50% of the time our machines are unproductive? So we, we set up a monitoring system. Our machines are now in productive 50% of the time. Um, we're monitoring alarms and 24 alarms that are preventing production are, are preventable. Um, maybe we optimize the tool path and reduce production time by four times. But again, you know, these are some, I guess, use cases to, to emphasize a point here. But with this information, it, it kind of changes what our assumption just was. The start of this, this entire storyboard is that one machine plus one operator is equal one part. That's the status quo. This is what's good. This this is, you know, this is what it is. But with digitalization and monitoring our machines and seeing the full transparency of what's occurring on the shop floor, that's not the case. Our machines are only in, pro in production 50% of the time. Half the time is it's being underutilized. We made some changes to toolpath, and every toolpath now is reducing production by 4%. There are 24 prevent preventable alarms to go out to your operators on the shop floor and you know, make these these changes of hey, we need to re-educate the guys on how to do you know X, Y, and Z. Um, and with that information, these alarms are now longer no longer preventing production for hours a day. And all this was achieved through digitalization, the idea of collecting data, utilizing this data to then make business critical decisions on the shop floor based on what we have in front of us. Now, you could ask the question, you know, who are making these changes, and, and then a real Realistic scenario, maybe not every business has a data analyst evaluating this information. There, maybe they don't have a data lake um, being captured and, and someone whose full time job it is to recognize the information, identify trend lines, make these action items into the business plans. Because if I told you your machine is productive 50% of the time and just left it at that, does that give you a clear instance of what you should do next? I mean, that's that's just it's it's just the reality of what it is, but it's not telling you or holding your hand as, as to exactly how this can be achieved. But like I mentioned, you know, not everyone has a data analyst. So so what exactly all the what exactly are the alternatives? 
Um, and that kind of leads into what we've been what we're talking about today is that with adaptive control monitoring, we can essentially have a turnkey solution installed directly on the controller that adapts to irregularities in the workpiece dynamically that um, you know, reduces the cycle time while also increasing the tool life. And this solution is, is like Garrett said, it's our bread and butter. We're, we're incredibly excited to show it off, um, jump into customers, and then really see the benefits it brings to their work environment. Um, and today I'm going to try to capture some of that excitement in a, a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so the top highlights of adaptive control, um, like I mentioned, cycle time reduction, um, you know, reducing the downtime, uh, extending tool life. Um, it's it, it kind of encapsulates the entire machining process and optimizes and increases um, you know, its, its full potential. The center slide here is to have some basic screens that are set up from the HMI perspective. So these are some screens you would essentially see when you're actually running or, or utilizing the application on the shop floor. Um, typical machining process and typical programming um, is is making a lot of assumptions. We're assuming the tool that is being machined is perfectly in dimension. Obviously, you can throw in some offsets here and there, but from a programming perspective, you know this is this is our tool. We're also assuming there are no irregularities in the material. You know, and from batch to batch, you're going to have soft spots and hard spots. You know, there's there's a lot of variability that occurs on the shop floor that you simply just can't program. Um, especially the wear and tear of the tool, or that's near the end, end of life, regularities of, you know, even in the, the uh, you know, machining environment. Um, and that's kind of why we design things within tolerance. We have, we have a tolerance measure of a high limit, low limit, anything between good enough to go to the next machine. Um, but the advantage of adaptive control here is we're essentially monitoring the torque being applied to the spindle. And during the cutting process, it's able to dynamically change on any type of irregularity that's thrown at it. Imagine putting your hand on the surface of a table and sliding it across and feeling whether there's bumps and dirts or grime or you know different smoothness. That's that's essentially the same idea we're we're implementing here from a software-based solution onto your controller. It's it's feeling the part as it machines. It's recognizing that, hey, this is a soft spot. I can machine a little bit faster. Hey, this is a hard spot. I'm going to machine a little bit slower. As it first enters the workpiece, it'll slow down before speeding back up again. And I think actually the next slide will illustrate this the best. So this is kind of showcasing exactly how adaptive control technology is working. If we're reading from the left to right, steps one through six, um, we have our spindle approaching the workpiece um, that it'll be machining. On the bottom, we have a blue line indicating our spindle with our solution installed on it, while the yellow line is indicating our spindle that's just the standard program feed rate. Um, for this scenario, we can assume that's 100% feed override. Um, so in a very real world scenario, you set up your workpiece, get your tools off, so that's everything set up, press cycle start, and pretty much sit there and watch. Now, if you're more timid, you'll probably have your hand on the emergency stop or the feed override ready to slow down on, on any type of thing like that might appear. But we can assume for this scenario that this is a tried and true um, program. This is a tried and true method. We're just going to click cycle start and walk away, go to the next machine. Maybe we're working on multiple machines, whatever. Um, but the program feed is going to stay consistent throughout the entire part cutting process, regardless of if it's being fully utilized or maybe it's being overutilized. Maybe it's going to throw a, a tool break. Maybe there's an irregularity in the, in the workpiece itself that's going to cause additional torque being applied to the spindle and, and therefore um, that extended pressure is going to reduce workpiece quality. A lot of variables can happen when, when there's really no safety check or backup. Um, so with adaptive control and having the ability to feel the workpiece as we cut throughout a, a dynamic process, um, Following that blue line, as we enter the workpiece, we're going at 150% feed override. This is a rapid movement. We are not in any cutting process. We're not machining in any way. Therefore, we're fully utilizing the speed of our controller. Prior to entering the workpiece, um, we drop down below the 100% feed override. Now, what studies have shown is that this is actually the area of where the most tool damage occurs, is when you're at 
when you're running at 100% feet override and you crash into the workpiece at that speed and you maintain 100% feet override, that's where the most amount of damage is going to be done to your tool. That'll be longer, I guess, hasten the process of your tool near its end of life. So to counteract that, we'll drop it down below the program feed override. Um, I was actually with a customer one time who was very concerned about tool life, and we dropped it down to as low as 30%. Um, every time it enters the workpiece, it dropped down to 30%. And then as you notice, after entering step two into three, as it's machining, it's recognizing that the spindle is not being fully utilized based on our tests and into the parameters we defined for this, for this machine. Um, since it's not being fully utilized, we're now going to gradually increase the feed override. And again, this is this is mitigating damage being done to the tool. And, and any moment we go above the 100% feed override is cycle time reduction throughout the cutting process. So as we're reading, we run in really fast into the workpiece, we slow down below the feed override, and then we gradually increase it back up. And then you can see again from step four, since we're not plunging into the workpiece, putting more strain on the spindle, again, it goes below 100% feed override. We're protecting our tool. Um, reading in from four to five, our material is far deeper than at any point in the other cutting process. And as a result, we stay consistently below the 100% feet override. Um, and again, this is all algorithms and all programs being done in the background dynamically on the, on the controller. The operator has nothing to do with these changes. The AI is simply taking over and recognizing the most optimal utilization path of the spindle throughout the cutting process. And since it's recognizing so much torque being applied to the spindle, it's going to consistently run below the program feed of nursing feed override. Again, this is to try to elongate the life of our tool, try to protect it as much as we can. We don't want to you know, push it too hard and have it end up breaking. Um, going into the halfway point of step five, as we lift our tool out of the material, we're cutting now less material. Um, adaptive control recognizes that the spindle is not being fully utilized. It can dynamically increase the feed override and stay consistently high and fast as it goes through until it exits the workpiece at step six. And again, it goes back to the maximum feed override as it jumps over to the next position and finds a new part to machine. From a video perspective, I just want to show this here. I think I encapsulated it. Um, the last step fairly well, but again, this is this is just highlighting the load being applied to the spindle. Um, so if we took the information and then the graph we saw in the last sense, the top screen is trying to maximize the utilization of the spindle. So as the spindle is machining um, and we're recognizing that it's not being fully utilized, we'll increase the feed override. Now, if the, if the spindle is being overutilized or underutilized, you know, there, there are no changes being done. Um, and that's really the, we're, there, the, that's really the advantage of what we're seeing here. So again, if you want to focus on the spindle load versus spindle load here, we're speeding up to maximize spindle load, we're slowing down to maximize spindle load, but the goal here is, is to try to fully utilize the spindle the entire time. If there's anything left on the table, we want to fully utilize it. And that shouldn't be confused with overusing your spindle. You know, we're just, we're ensuring that the spindle is being utilized at, at that maximum level. And what I mean by overutilizing the spindle will actually be the next slide here, um, right here. So the next slide is actually gonna showcase a scenario where the spindle is overutilized um, because not only adaptive control is, is protecting the tool and, and reducing to, uh, cycle time, but it's also monitoring, hey, is there a load that's going to break our tool? So in this scenario, the adaptive control alarm was basically triggered as the spindle was being overutilized and stopped for complete production. This is saving the tool, saving the workpiece, whereas a solution without adaptive control will continue to machine um, and will continue to essentially grind out that entire process with a broken tool. Um, and this is done again just through the, the feel and the touch perspective. Imagine having your hand on a table, you're, <clears throat> you're sliding it around and you prick yourself on a, on a clothespin or something. You know, you, you felt, hey, there's, there's some danger here. Same thing applies with adaptive control. It's expecting a certain torque to be applied to the spindle during this cutting process. If it's machining at 10 Newton meters, <clears throat> and all of a sudden recognizes that we're now machining at two newton meters. It therefore infers that there's a potential tool break or the tool has already been broken and it should be changed. Or best case scenario is as the torque is being applied dynamically to the spindle, your feed override is slowing down, slowing down, slowing down until, <clears throat> until it recognizes this is too dangerous to continue machining. I'm going to throw a stop right here. 
and prevent any type of tool breakage, which is what we saw in this little video. Where essentially adaptive control recognizes if we're following the spindle, it's going to go, go, go until it reaches the low that throws into red. And then it says, whoa, this is way too high. We're going to stop the machine and basically call an operator to investigate, check, to make sure we're OK to fully machine again. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the obvious benefits of, of not breaking tools is going to extend the overall machine production time or production time on the shop floor. Um, I don't know how long it takes for you, know, you guys to first even recognize that there's a tool change, but then also need to change the tool, go back to the process. You know, where did it break in the machine? Um, where in the NC code do we need to fall back from? That all of this is is you know can just be thrown under the bucket of uh, you know any type of machine downtime. And, and if our goal again is to go back to our storyboard of hey, we need that fourth part without changing any of the status quo on, on our shop floor. Um, tool breakage could be a major uh, a major roadblock in that process um, just from a resolving from a resolving machine perspective. Um, now it's even if it does break, you know, breaking the tool is that's something you know, you can change. But if you break the workpiece or the part you're designing on the you know the, the last step of the of the um, you know full job that that could be detrimental. That could be detrimental if you spend a week of time machining something and then you crash and it breaks through and now it's no longer within quality specs, that could be a brutal waste of time. Or even taking a machine down. Um, you know, these these are these are worst case scenarios that we're going to try to avoid at all costs. So where can the solution be applied? Um, pretty much anything that is utilizing mills, turning machines, grinding machines, you know, Anything in the in the machining process that's going to have any type of torque being applied to the spindle that can be fully utilized and and you know taking over. We we see this across the board from from any machine shop really. Um, and I want to emphasize, you know, sometimes people will assume that this is just a an optimization suite. You know, when they do this from a digital perspective on on NX Cam or um, you know Master Cam Vericut or whatever. Um, and we don't want to say that this is replacing those solutions, but think of it more as like a value add solution. You can still optimize the tool path. You can still, you know, fully prove out the process in a, in a digital environment. But really where this comes to shine and kind of sets itself apart is that it, it's feeling dynamically throughout the cutting process. Every workpiece is going to be different. Every, every you know, spindle as it ends, it's, as it nears its end of life versus where it's brand new, it's going to be different. And you can program things to be within tolerance and fully optimized, but you can't program something to adapt to uh, a what if statement, you know, within the NC program. And that's essentially what adaptive control will be doing every time, the entire time on the shop floor. Where you have all your machines essentially listening and feeling and dynamically changing throughout the entire cutting process to make sure you're fully utilizing your spindle while also reducing cycle time, while also extending the tool life to the best they can. Um, as for the full installation and, and you know training process, um, I was on a customer site a couple weeks ago, I believe. You know, time's going by so fast. Maybe it was a couple months ago now, um, but it took me about 20 minutes to install. It's a software-based solution that I can walk up to a controller, plug it in, turn it on. Now it's installed. Then we did a couple training programs. So essentially, adaptive control is going to recognize what the status quo would, would be. So it's you're going to run an operation in training, recognize that this is the NC program that we're utilizing. These are the tools in that exact NC program that are going to be utilized. Um, you can make some additional configurations and changes. Maybe you don't want adaptive control changing the feed override during a uh, you know the, the last um, finishing operation. Um, we can enable that. So let's say you know 10, 10 tools all leading up to the end of the operation are using adaptive control. The last tool will turn adaptive control off for that process and just worry about tool monitoring. Um, there's there's customizations, way to tweak it to really fit your needs. Um, after it's been learned and uh, customized to fit those needs, we then can throw it into adaptive control and let it take over and you know fully utilize the benefits of, of the application. Um, some testimonials, I guess you'd say. Uh, here we had a customer that saw cycle time reduction by seven to eight percent um, throughout the NC program. Um, this customer saw three different cycle times or cycle savings uh, measuring from 14, 16, and 17 percent. Um, and they were also being, you know, 
notified essentially when the tools are fully worn and, and have near their end of life. Um, and then here on this machine or this this company, we also saw a, a scenario where we were seeing entitled time savings ranging from four to thirty three percent of of each tool um, of in, in an entire operation. So across the board, we're we're seeing benefits now. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to say that every process is going to reduce cycle time. We, we have seen some times where um, essentially the process identified that it should be slower than normal. Um, and this is really from a toolware perspective. Um, so it's kind of deciding what what is most needed from your perspective. Do you need to elongate your tools? Is that a huge um, sunk cost in the production cycle? Do we need to make more parts? Do we want best of both worlds? You know, these these are questions that you can be asking um, throughout that entire uh, you know pilot and, and machining process stage. Um, but with that, I'm, I'm going to conclude my presentation and be happy to answer any questions. Again, my name is Stephen Free, and we have Garrett Zilka here as well from our partner manager perspective. Um, we are thrilled to be able to show this to you guys today. Obviously, it doesn't capture the excitement of being on the shop floor and, and seeing the cycle time savings and benefits and you, you kind of see the dollar signs you know running through the mind but um, i'm hoping I'm hoping i was able to at least capture some of that joy and some of that uh um i guess clarity of, of what we do how we do it and, and how it works exactly through the powerpoint so again thank you Steve, thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, you know, if, if there's any questions, uh, please let us know. Either uh, speak up or or put them in the chat. It'd be great. Um, would be great, and be glad to field those. So I'll give that um, a, a minute here. But I'll also say that you know, um, you know, we we ask that you challenge challenge Siemens and and Electromatic to put this in your shop. Um, and on your machines to really see the ROI for yourselves. Um, and that that's putting putting it out there. Um, and we'd really like to do that. We can offer trial installs of the product. Um, so, uh, you know, get in touch with your sales person over at Electromatic or contact um, myself directly, but um, be glad to um, put it in your shop and, and let you, anyone see the, the direct ROI themselves. Any any questions before we uh, conclude? I don't have anything coming through. So um, with that, I think that we can conclude the webinar for today. Um, Nick and Amy and Steve, um, anything from your end? No, that was great. Again, appreciate everyone's time and uh, look forward to, to working with everyone on this. Thank you.